Welcome back. I'm your host, Michael Dell Brown. Today, we are going to talk about a very exciting song called A Love Letter in Your Absence. And I want to talk about the inspiration behind this poem. I wrote this love song for my precious wife. Yes, and I wrote this letter not here in the United States. I wrote this song, this poem, in China. My wife is from China, from Nanjing, China, and we lived there together, and I worked for the university teaching English to university students, undergraduates, graduates, and postgraduates for five years. I've only been back in the United States since 2016. So I spent the previous five years in China, and I will have some wonderful stories about China to share with you in the future. The song, poem, let me share this with you. I'm gonna read the poem to begin. It is called A Love Letter in Your Absence. And while I was in China, and my wife, who is a, a scientist, a professor, and a very busy lady. Uh, she was always on the go, and there would be times when she would have to travel, and I would be all by myself in China. And my Chinese is not very good. Uh, <laughs> people say, do you speak Chinese? I would say, e dien, dien. I was just, oh, just a little bit, just a little bit. My, my Mandarin, my Putawa was not very good. So I had to struggle sometimes when she would be traveling. Well, I wrote this poem, and I'll share it with you now. And this was written for my dear wife. Dear lover, I can only use words to touch you. My hands cannot reach past the kilometers that separate us in time. I wait, but at least I do not wait for the vanity of emptiness, not knowing who you are or for whom I wait. I do not imagine you with the imagination of a writer of fiction. I do not conjure up a heroine suffering long to meet a lover off to war, separated by, for some worthy cause. Our love is not the victim of some conflict needed as the recipe for suspense. It is enough that we love well and no one can interfere. No one can separate us with forbidden love or tempt us with the taste of enticement. I loved you before I met you in the anticipation that came to me prophetic in my dreams. I dream like Joseph dreamed, but the stars pay homage to the love we share, and we share love, and there is no drought. For seven years, for seven years, our hearts are filled with plenty. We are the standard bearers. We are the example. Write us down for posterity. Write us down so that others may hold on in hope of what only seems true in another's dream. Say, I love you with me so my heart and ears can unite and sing. Let those three words band together to form a trilogy. Wow, you're, you're probably thinking, that's a long poem. <laughs> well, it's a mouthful, yes. But let's take a couple of minutes and go verse by verse through this wonderful poem. The title is quite obvious, A Love Letter in Your Absence. So I wrote this because my wife had to travel a lot. She was traveling a great deal. She not only was a professor, but she also she developed a biopesticide and a biofertilizer. She has many patents on many things. She's beautiful and she's smart. I love a smart woman and a beautiful one too. So the title dealt with the fact that she was absent a lot. A love letter in your absence. You're not here. So I'm writing this as she's gone and I'm missing my wife. Dear, Dear lover, I can only use words to touch you. You're not here physically. I can only touch you with my words as I reach out. Right? My hands cannot reach past 
is the kilometers that separate us in time. I wait. I'm waiting for her to return. But at least I'm not waiting feeling empty. There's no vanity or emptiness here because at least I know who you are. Now when you're single and you're alone and you're and you're not in a relationship and you don't have that person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, it feels very empty to be alone because you have no idea who is the right person for you. Where is she? When is she going to show up? How am I going to find her? So this is the feeling that the poem is generating. I don't have to suffer like that anymore. Before I met my wife, yes, I did feel that way, right? There, there was that vanity, that emptiness, waiting, not knowing. Where is she? What's taking her so long? <laughs> Why am I having to wait so long to meet this right person? I wait, but at least I do not wait in the vanity of emptiness not knowing who you are or for whom i wait and it goes on to say i do not imagine you with the imagination of a writer of fiction so i'm not telling myself she's not real she doesn't exist sometimes when you're alone and you're lonely or by yourself you you can't even imagine the right person you feel like a writer of fiction to even discuss your future wife, your future husband, whoever your future spouse is going to be. It goes on to say, I do not conjure up a hair and suffering, long to meet a lover, up to war, separated for some worthy cause. Sometimes you're in a relationship or a marriage, and the person's in the military, and they're off fighting a war. So they're off for some worthy cause, which you couldn't hardly argue the cause. They do need to be gone. My wife, right, she's traveling. She has to make money with her job. And, and to get the word out about these wonderful things that she as a scientist has discovered, she wants to get the word out. She wants the whole world to know what she's doing and, and what she has to offer. So I have to understand her travel. I have to be understanding and supportive as a husband while my wife is away taking care of business. It goes on to say, Our love, love is not the victim of some conflict needed as the recipe for suspense. Our love is not the victim of some conflict. And conflict is sometimes needed. It's a recipe for suspense, to create suspense. In a story, they will, they will create a conflict. So there's no conflict. She's just gone. That's not a conflict or reason enough for a conflict. It is enough that we love well And no one can interfere So there's some very subtle things going on here. He's saying there's no conflict. There's nobody coming after me or coming after her to destroy the relationship. And, and even though we're separated off and on at times, we're still doing very well in spite of the, the separation. He says, our love is not the victim, right? It's not victimized. There's nothing wrong. And it's not the recipe for suspense. We don't need suspense. In the United States, we don't say suspense so much. We might say a relationship has drama. And of course, we want to avoid drama. He goes on to say, No one can separate us with forbidden love Or tempt us with the taste of enticement So there's no unfaithfulness or cheating. He goes on to say in the words of this beautiful poem, the song, I loved you before I met you in the anticipation which came to me prophetic in my dreams. Wow, what a great line. What a great verse. He's telling his wife, I'm telling my wife, I loved you even before I met you. I was that hopeful. I had faith. Wow, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need faith to survive. We need hope to survive. Without hope, we get wiped out, right? You can't even enjoy your life if you don't have hope. Hope for the future. Hope that things will get better for you, especially when you're alone and you're lonely and you're waiting and you're hoping for your life to change. He says, I loved you before I met you. And the anticipation, so he's anticipating change. He's not thinking because I'm in this holding pattern.
because my life seems to be stuck in a rut. Nothing's changing. The things that I want to happen haven't yet happened, right? He feels like he's in this holding pattern, yet he's still hopeful, yet he still loved her before he met her. There's this anticipation and he says, it came to me prophetic in a dream. In my dream, I see you. In my dream, I know you. In my dream, I love you. In my dream, I feel like God is giving me a dream, just like he gave Joseph a dream. He gave Joseph many dreams, right? He says, I dream like Joseph dreamed, but the stars pay homage to the love we share and we share love. I dream like Joseph dreamed. Remember, Joseph in the Bible is the great dreamer. And when I wrote this, I was thinking of not only Joseph from the Bible and how God gave him a dream. And in the dream, his, his brothers bowed down before him because God was going to exalt Joseph over the, the, the entire nation of Egypt. He would be second in command. And Joseph had this powerful, amazing dream. And his brothers are very angry and upset. So I got this idea about dreaming, not from Martin Luther King Jr. who said, I have a dream. And I, and I wonder sometimes how many people stop and realize that when Martin Luther King was talking about, I have a dream, where he got that from? He got that from the Bible. Martin Luther King Jr. got the I have a dream speech. Part of his inspiration, much of his inspiration, certainly the title I have a dream, he got that from the Bible. And this idea that Joseph was a dreamer and Martin Luther King spoke of himself as a dreamer. He spoke about climbing to the mountaintop. He, he spoke about I have a dream and I also have a dream and I had this wonderful dream and I incorporated that idea into the song. Well, he goes on to say, there is no drought for seven years, for seven years. And remember, there was in Egypt a drought. But this has a double meaning to it, sort of like what we would call a double entendre, beautiful technical device that we use in poetry. Well, where is it in this particular song? It's in this idea of seven years, seven years, and we repeat seven years twice. There were two sets, remember, of, of years of famine and feast. But also, this is talking about Joseph, but there's a subtle hint here with the seven years referring to Jacob and Rachel and how Jacob loved Rachel and he worked seven years for Rachel, right? And he felt that drought because he loved her and he wanted to be with her and he was so anxious to be her husband and to have her as his wife. And then Uncle Laban lied to Joseph and tricked him and had him marry his oldest daughter, Leah. But then Joseph had to work another seven years to secure Rachel, who was the love of his heart, of his life and his heart. Well, it, it goes on quickly. This is, we are the standard bearers. We are what everyone wants, a great marriage, a great relationship. We are the example. Write us down for posterity. Make a record. Take note of this relationship. Write us down so that others may hold on in hope of what only seems true in another's dream. Sometimes you'll see a great couple together and you'll say, oh, that's never going to happen to me. Oh, I wish I had what they have. And that's always what I wanted in my life before I met my wife. Say I love you with me so my heart and is can unite and sing. So in this, we have the uniting, the coming together of the heart and the ears. All that you think, all that you feel, all that you hear. And not only that, but what you say, because he goes, let these three words band together to form a trilogy. Say it with me. Say, I love you with me. This song is really something special. It's, I think, one of my finest work. Now, the artist that sings, his name is Zachman, and he does a superb job with the music arrangement for this song. Well, I'm doing a lot of talking here. And before we finish today, I want to address the questions that have come in. I want to thank you for writing. Our first question comes from, and I'm only going to pronounce the last name because I can't pronounce the first name very well, uh, a Miss Lee from Hong Kong. And she writes in and she asks me the question, have I ever been to Hong Kong before? And that's quite an interesting question. She's from Hong Kong. She wants to know if I've ever been there. Well, the answer to your question is yes, I have been to Hong Kong. I've been there twice and I absolutely love Hong Kong. 
I love Hong Kong for many reasons. I like being seeing the water in every direction that I turn. I love Hong Kong because of the people. They were very warm, very friendly, very inviting, and they speak English. I was so excited when I'm in China. Very few people, and I love China, by the way. I love being there. It was one of the highlights of my entire life. We'll talk more about China later. But I love being in Hong Kong because the people spoke English, so I didn't have to struggle speaking my poor version of Chinese. So I had just an amazing time. The hotels in Hong Kong were beautiful. I stayed at one hotel close to the airport. And I got to travel throughout Hong Kong. I remember even seeing a boxing gym. I was a boxer years ago, and I found a boxing gym when I was there, and, and、uh, spent some time there working out. So,、uh, yes, to answer your question, Miss Lee, I have been to Hong Kong. And if you haven't been to Hong Kong, those of you who are watching, it's an amazing place to go on vacation. And yes, they speak English, and the food is. Just out of this world. So yes, I have been to Hong Kong. Second question: Where does your inspiration come from?、Uh, this is a gentleman.、Uh, last name is Stokes, and he is from Michigan, right here in the United States. Wants to know generally where does your inspiration come from? Now, the gospel music that we produce, my inspiration comes from the Bible, and even many of the romantic songs I would say also come from the Bible. But inspiration is an interesting thing. It comes from all over the place. Sometimes you're inspired by your own life, things that have happened. Sometimes I'm inspired by a YouTube video that someone will post, or by something that I see on Facebook. Sometimes people will post a very beautiful image,、uh, like these magnolias, for example, and then I'll be inspired to write a poem or a song just by seeing something so beautiful, something so magnificent that can. Bring inspiration as well. And then the the last question from a gentleman named Timothy from Miami Beach, Florida. He asked the question, "Who are your favorite singers, and what are some of those songs?" I'm assuming he means some of the songs from my favorite singers. Well, two of my all-time favorite singers are Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder, I grew up listening to. I mentioned this on another video.、Uh, one of my favorite songs by Stevie Wonder is "My Cherie Amour." Now, Stevie Wonder has a very large collection of songs, and、uh, some of my favorites by him are a song called "Creeping," a song called "You and I." Beautiful, beautiful music. He has another song called "Golden Lady." I love that song, and、uh, he's one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites is Nat King Cole, and I, that's probably doesn't surprise too many people. I think a lot of people just love the music of Nat King Cole, and some of the songs that we're producing, you can hear. I think that style. Some of it sounds like something Stevie Wonder would sing. Some of it sounds like something. Nat King Cole would sing. What are some of my Nat King Cole favorites? Well, the song "Unforgettable." I love that song. I love it when he's singing with his daughter, and also when he sings it by himself. And his daughter Natalie Cole is also one of my favorites. And I love the song she sings, "The Very Thought of You." Those are some of my all-time favorite songs. Well. Next week we're going to be covering a song called "He Rose." Now, just a week ago, two weeks ago, we had Palm Sunday, and then last week we had Resurrection Sunday. So this song is in honor of Resurrection Sunday. We are going to share that amazing song with you next week when we meet again. My name is Michael Del Brown, your host, and I'm excited to spend some time with you. Thank you. Please like. Share, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Thank you.